Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Ye, I'm the co-founder of Scroll. Today I'd like to introduce Scroll's architecture and our pre-alpha testnet upgrade. Um, before diving into more detail, for those who are not familiar with who you are, uh, so Scroll is a general purpose clean solution for Ethereum. So in short, it's just making Ethereum cheaper, faster, with a higher throughput. And more specifically, we are building an EVM equivalent ZK rollup. So technically speaking, it's a ZK rollup solution, which is considered to be the most secure scaling solution with shortest finality uh, based on math. And uh, we are also EVM equivalent by saying that, uh, I mean, like in our ZK rollup, it's by code level equivalent, which means developer can reuse everything that they, they use on Ethereum layer one, every toolings, including like hard hat and all those develop, development toolings. And we can achieve like native by code level compatible, which means you can migrate the code from layer one to layer two seamlessly. And uh, so in the rest of the talk, it will be divided into, into two parts. In the first half, I will talk about the architecture of Scroll and uh, like how your transaction is being processed on Scroll. And in the second half, I will talk about our important upgrade for our testnet and the roadmap like in the, for the future. So now let's look at, take a look at the architecture of Scroll. So before diving into more detail, to give you a better sense of how Scroll works, let's take at the traditional like, architecture for ZK Rollup. So the idea of ZK Rollup is that instead of sending all the transactions to layer one, you send all your transactions to a layer two node. And then layer two node will run some zero knowledge proof algorithm and a generator proof. So the proof will be verified on smart contract layer one. And uh, so verifying the proof is mathematically equivalent to executing all the transactions. So that's how you, you get the scalability, because for example, Ethereum only gets 10 TPS, it can, so, but, but each transaction is verifying some proof, which is equivalent to executing 100 transactions. Then you can scale your, your network massively. So intuitively, uh, like the architecture of scroll looks like this. So you need some sequencer, which is sequencing the transaction after receiving that, and the generate layer two blocks. And then you also need some relayer to relay message between layer one and layer two. For example, like there are some deposits from layer one directly through the bridge contract, and uh, your relayer need to relay this message from layer one to layer two. And also there are some deposits where like sequencer need to send this message to the relayer. And uh, after sequencer sequencing the transaction, and getting layer two blocks, it will send to the prover, and the prover will run some algorithm, like the owner proof algorithm, and generate the proof. And the relayer will submit the proof as the data. Um, and uh, a unique feature of Scroll is that we are not running this prover in a centralized way, but instead we have a decentralized prover network for generating the proof. So in our architecture, we have a coordinator which will receive blocks from the sequencer and the generate execution trace. It will dispatch the execution trace for different blocks to different provers in our network. And uh, the provers, we call them rulers in our network to distinguish from, from miners. They, they will run, run the key EVM and generate the proof, and will, then we will send back the proof to the coordinator. The coordinator will then send to the relayer and the relay like, roll up to the layer one. So, uh, so the magic thing actually happens on the ruler side where uh, you are running some ZK EVM and generating proof for the validity of all the transactions inside the block. So now let's take a look at the, what's happening inside the roller. So uh, after receiving this execution trace from the coordinator of a certain block, uh, the, the, roller, the, the roller will run ZK EVM. So what is ZK EVM? So ZK EVM is composed of several circuits. So the, the, the circuit means, so, for, so one circuit can verify certain functionalities for certain parts. For example, EVM circuit can verify that your EVM so like state machine moves correctly from, for example, like push to pop and to the next, next, by, by, next opcode you are executing. And then RAM circuit is useful to prove that your read and write for this virtual machine is consistent. For example, you, you, you previously write to some place and then you read. So this RAM circuit can, can prove that those are consistent. And there is also a storage circuit, which means uh, when you are updating the, the storage, you are, you are doing things correctly. And there are some other circuits to prove some other like, functionalities for, for EVM, including like ECDSC circuit for signature and some bytecode circuits and some Kachak circuits for other functionalities. And you need a circuit input builder in between to translate your execution trace directly fetched from gas to the circuit specific witness. Um, and then, like, so intuitively, the EVM should have multiple proofs, right? Because it needs to have a proof for EVM circuit, as a proof for RAM circuits. So, but so all those proofs need to be verified on, on layer one efficient. 
So what we do here is that we build another aggregation circuit. So this aggregation circuit is used for proving that the proof is correct. So for example, like you know, your EVM, the aggregation circuit is saying that EVM, EVM proof is correct, RAM proof is correct, and other circuit proofs are also correct. So this is your aggregation circuit, and uh, in the end, you will only have one block proof for, for, the, whole, for the whole block uh, to prove that your execution trace is correct. And uh, moreover, like, notice, what's to notice that uh, our, our coordinator will dispatch a block to different provers. So those rollers will generate proof in parallel for different blocks. They are not competing for the same block, which will uh, like, have a better utility for the prover network in, in, our net in our system, because all the provers are, are doing something useful. They are not doing something redundant. Um, and now let's take a look at how your transaction is being processed on scroll and the workflow of scroll from a timeline perspective. So, from, uh, so let's start with the workflow of Zikirov. So uh, on Ethereum layer one, because you need a consensus, so you generate block uh, very slowly. And on layer two, you can generate block much faster and with a higher throughput. So you generate multiple blocks, and then after a period of time, you roll up your transaction data and, uh, and generate a validity proof to prove that all the transactions are correct and send that to Ethereum layer one. But worth to notice that this block data doesn't really rely on validity proof. It's used for data availability. So what you can do here is that also part of Scroll's design is that we separate this block data with validity proof. So you will like, submit the block data first on chain to get some like, committed version, which, for example, users can see their, their transaction on chain uh, like without, even without the proof. And, they, and then like, you wait for some proof generation to, to finally finalize your, your transaction. So uh, accordingly, like, you have three different status for your layer two transaction. One is called pre-committed which means your transaction is sent to a sequencer, and the sequencer has already included your transaction in a layer two block. So it was sent back a pre-confirmation, which is just maybe three seconds and something like that. So you get this pre-confirmation from, from our sequencer. And the next state is called committed, which means we already roll up your data on chain, and which, may, which usually takes minutes. And uh, so users can, this is a much stronger confirmation because users can see their data and they even like, replay the data by themselves. And finally, it's finalized, which indicates that uh, you, you already generated the proof, and the proof got verified on, on layer one. So that's the final state where you get the final confirmation on layer one because your proof is generated and verified. Let, let's take a look at the, like from a timeline perspective. So you send your transaction to a, to a sequencer, and the sequencer has included your transaction in the block. So the, the orange one, it means the block is pre-confirmed. And then like, the, the sequencer will upload your uh, like data and with some proof to layer one's row up contract. And then like, your, 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 your block gets com committed. And then the sequencer will dispatch this block to, to the coordinator, and the coordinator will find one prover inside our network for proof generation, like to, to generate proof for this block. And similarly, for the next block, sequencer will also, like, after committing this, this block, will also let like, coordinator to find a, find a ruler in, in, the, in, the, in the whole system. And uh, similarly, you can do the same thing for, for block three and block four. Uh, and uh, after, after those proof generation, the, the prover will send back the proof to the coordinator. And uh, the coordinator receives multiple proofs. And then we do another like, dispatch to dispatch those, pro those proofs to another prover and let the prover do some aggregation to further reduce the, 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 the verification cost because you can actually uh, aggregate multiple block proofs inside one, inside using one, one proof. And then after this uh, proof aggregation, you finally get one proof which can prove that uh, P1, P2, P3 are correct, which means uh, the, the, the block one, block two, block three, the transaction inside are valid. And then you submit this, block, submit this proof on chain for verification, and uh, the, 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 the rough contract will use the previously input as some public input and this proof to verify that it is correct. And then, like, finally, your block gets finalized. So that's the final state for, uh, for your transaction. Um, and we have built a special rollup explorer to show the block status. So for example, you, you have like a few seconds ago, uh, you have pre-committed block, uh, which is the orange one. And then a minute ago, you have multiple committed block. And there is a commit transaction hash where you can find which transaction is committing your data and you can find your data on chain. Um, and uh, there is also fi like finalized transaction hash, which means, for example, your, your, your proof gets verified and there is a, a finalized transaction hash there for showing like, which transaction contains this proof and we, like, we, when you get verified. So this is a special explorer like, built by us for uh, letting users to know that what's happening like, inside. And now, uh, 
like after some like talking about the technical uh, background, uh, I will introduce our Scrolls pre-alpha testnet and where we are. So three months ago, we have released our testnet, our pre-alpha testnet. Um, that version is mostly for the community users, where we can get user feedback, uh, like they can, they can play with our pre-deployed applications, for example, a fork of Uniswap, and also through their familiar like, wallet, like MetaMask. So it's all for users, and the users can also bridge their assets between layer one and layer two. Like, for example, they can experience the deposit and the withdrawal. They can also see their transaction status through this Ruark Explorer. So that's, that's where we are. Like, it's, it's all for collecting feedback from the community to improve our UI and UX, and also fix some bugs ahead of time. And uh, we'd like to thank the, our community for their helpful feedback so that we, we fix a lot of like, bugs on the, on the UI side and they improved our, uh, our front end a lot. And we have onboarded over 10,000 10, users to test our bridge and depth. Um, and at, at, at the meantime, we are still scaling up our pooling infrastructure to support 100,000 users on our waitlist. So the reason for that is that we don't open enough provers for this, for this test net. So once we open this like, decentralized prover network for everyone, uh, we can scale out the, the users or the transaction throughput like, massively. Uh, a few days ago, we make a very big announcement, which is the upgrade version for our pre-alpha test net. Um, so it's a very important milestone for us. Where, uh, so the most important upgrade for our test net is that we are not only a test net only for users and for pre-deployed contracts, but we, it's a test net for, for the developers, where uh, developers can, support, can deploy arbitrary smart contracts on us. So it's very important because it's, like, you know, it's not only like, interaction between users, but you can actually you know, deploy on things on us. And uh, you can experience a seamless migration without any need to change any line of your code. You can just directly copy-paste your, your code from layer one and directly deploy on layer two. Um, and we also support all the toolings around because we are natively EVM compatible, native and even EVM equivalency on the backhaul level. We can support Remix, Hardhat, and even Foundry, and all the toolings around. Uh, and we, uh, like days ago, we have uh, a hackathon at East Global for letting hackers to, to register to our testnet and deploy things on us. We have do also done some live demo at, at East Global, and also like yesterday at the ZK community session where like, we let the community to deploy smart contract on us. And we have opened this register to all the developers. So if you want to become an early tester or the contributor, sign up uh, at scroll.io slash early dev. And uh, like you, can, you can experience how, how easy it is, that is to, to deploy things on us. Now, just a quick summary for, for users and developers. Um, so the developer experience will be exactly the same as the Ethereum layer one. Uh, and uh, so for, for the concrete performance, so layer two block generation takes less than three seconds, which means for example, like for, for users, you can get the, your, your pre-confirmation like within three seconds. It can be even further as we move, move to like multi-block aggregation. It can be even bring down to like one second. And the, your experience will be pretty good. And the deposit usually takes two minutes because you need to wait for six layer one blocks. So it's not because of us, but you, you need to wait for like layer one block, block confirmation. And withdrawal takes uh, around like six minutes or, or more, depending on your concrete, like how many provers you have in your network and what's the throughput. So Usually, this takes like two minutes to, to one hour. But the fastest prover generation already, like for one block, is six minutes. So it's very fast. And uh, yeah, so that's for, for our pre alpha testnet. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about our, our roadmap and, uh, and where we are and what we, we plan to oh. do. Uh, from a high level, our roadmap looks like this. So in phase one, we have a pre alpha testnet for users and the developers. So users can interact, and developers can deploy arbitrary contracts through uh, as far as they, are, they, they registered. And uh, in phase two, we will move to uh, alpha testnet, which we will move to that very, very soon, which is a permissionless version. And uh, like anyone can directly use that without any, any permission. And uh, de developer can deploy like, any contract without like, register. And uh, so that's for our alpha testnet. We are moving to that very soon. And in phase three, we open this layer two proof of outsourcing to the, to the prover community. Or ULATES has a large overlap with the minor community, so which means uh, in phase three, we will open proof generation for anyone to be the prover, and they can run their, their prover machine and be one of our proving nodes to generate proof for us. So that's in phase three. And then we will move to phase four, which is our mainnet. So the distance between like, those, like before mainnet is that one is that uh, because the EVM can have many lines of code, which as Vitalik indicated, that it won't be bug-free for quite a long time. So we need very rigid secure auditing for our ZK EVM 
to be really confident that we, we, can, we can reach the state of MagNet. And also we need to wrap up the, some of the rest leaky circuit to make that more sound and also improve our performance massively, like through poor optimization and circuit optimization. And in the fifth file, we will apply some research results, which we are, we are doing like during the, like in parallel with the development, is that, for example, a decentralized sequencer to make the sequencer more censorship resistant. And uh, also, like we, we can take, we can, we can, we, are, we are doing some survey for some zero knowledge virtual machine and see if there are some interesting part to improve our zk EMC efficiency. And so that's our like high level roadmap. And the one thing which we hear really uh, like a lot of things from the, the community is that people usually ask about our decentralized prover and what's the requirement for running such a prover node and what's our uh, like plan for 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 hardware. So like so, I will tell a little bit more about our plan for this hardware acceleration. So we have three stages. So in stage one, uh, we will build a private ZKVM like, GPU cluster for running this, this prover. So or we have already built a very fast GPU solution to generate proof for our ZKVM circuits. So the current performance is really good. Like for example, one million gas only takes six minutes to generate proof. Like people usually think uh, like ZK, generating ZK proof takes a, has a such overhead and uh, it's unaffordable. But you know, like it's actually very fast on, on, on our GPU prover. And besides that, besides the GPU solution we have built, we have also built a private GPU cluster to provide the very stable computation power for, for our testnet at, at this stage. Um, and uh, so it's already there, and it's already live there. And uh, meanwhile, we are collaborating with several large companies, which are aiming at like making the owner proof faster. They are ZK hardware companies, and they build more customized solutions for. Uh, for making prover faster. For example, they, they are building some FPGA solution, ASIC solution, and the GPU solution. So that's in stage one. Like we, we, we started this collaboration, we already built a cluster there. And then in stage two, we will give access to our hardware partners to run our prover. So they can test their provers and a generate proof for us. But at, at stage two, it's still for large partners, which they are committed to generate proof for us, and uh, something like that. And we believe that using even more customized prover can shorten the finality time and uh, massively improve the user experience because you get cheaper prover and with even faster finality. And so that's stage two. And uh, in stage three, we will finally move to this permissionless prover, where I call that layer two proof outsourcing, where you are letting the external parties to run, run the prover. And uh, we will open source our GPU prover with a permissionless license for everyone to use. So even now, like our CPU prover is totally open source. You can already run the CPU prover uh, if you want, but just the CPU GPU prover, we, we are still like you know uh, improving the performance and it will be open source later. And anyone can be can run our prover, and the prover access will be permissionless, and they can anyone can generate proof at home for us, and they can also buy the, some customized hardware from those companies or even stick to use. Because you're, there are some companies are providing some proof as a service, so you can stick there and use their service to generate proof for us. So that's basically our 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 plan for this hardware acceleration. Um, and uh, one last thing is that so we have a very solid and decentralized tech team. So we have four directions. One is the infrastructure team, which is building out our uh, the whole infrastructure, making that more more robust um, and to support the permissionless testnet. And uh, it's usually based in Asia and Europe. And we have ZK team, which building the ZK circuits and some crypto parts, and for example, optimizing the prover performance. Um, so those two are like engineer teams, and we have we are we are, we are across like six or seven time zones. Uh, it's, it's totally decentralized. And also, besides the engineer team, we also have an in-house security team, which makes things really special because the security team, because we really care about user security, right? There are so many like bridges or, or platform get hacked. So we have this security team, which is composed of several experts, uh, in, in, like expertise in blockchain security, smart contract auditing, and the crypto cryptography. So they will be like in charge of our, our security of the whole system, and also ex uh, like collaborate with external hackers and auditors uh, to, to make our system more secure. And finally, we have a research team exploring very like multiple research directions, for example, how, how to decentralize the sequencer and how to upgrade the next generation's uh, pr like proof system and uh, doing, doing a lot of interesting research like that. And also around Ethereum, like we, we are actually really contributing to, to a lot of EIPs. And uh, yeah, so that's part of the research team. And uh, our vision is that we want to onboard the next billion of users for Ethereum because we think you know, making the transactions really cheap and, uh, and uh, your confirmation really fast will make more users going to Ethereum ecosystem. 
And uh, everything we build is totally open. And especially for the ZKVM part, we are co-built with, uh, with a large community, for example, the Privacy and Scaling Exploration Team from ECM Foundation and several other community members. And we want to fight for decentralization across different levels, like starting from decentralization of the prover. So uh, if you are vision aligned and you really like what we are building, and uh, we are still hiring, and check out our hiring page. And uh, I think, yes, that's it. And thank you for it. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so obviously you have this like kind of cool infrastructure with like the prover and the sequencer. Could you talk about how like gas fees work in Scroll? How you like price transactions? Yes, yeah, so the gas fee currently we hard code that to be exactly the same as ECM layer one. But it's my subject to change if it doesn't match the proving cost, but it will be minor, mostly targeting at some pre compiles very expensive pre compiles which are not ZK friendly, but most opcodes will be the same. And uh, right now, it's uh, exactly the same. So. Hi. Uh, can I know the data availability so, uh, strategy for Scroll? Yeah, so that's a good question. So currently, we are dire di like directly submitting the raw transaction data on chain as part of the data availability. And we do believe that dunk sharding and other like cheaper like data solutions on Ethereum is coming very soon. And also, like by submitting the, the raw transaction data, like users can replay the transaction when you are in the committing stage. So you don't need to wait even wait for the proof generation time to get a stronger confirmation ahead of time. And yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, what's the impact of reorgs on Ethereum on the components like the sequencer coordinator and the prover? Uh, so you're asking like how for, uh, how do you handle reorgs on layer one? Handle what? Reorgs, reorganizations, or blocks. Uh, you mean like when layer ones block are not confirmed or? Uh, yeah, if, if blocks get re reorganized on the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, when, you, when your transaction is within layer two, uh, it can be confirmed really fast. So this, uh, like the, the, it will only influence your deposit. So for now, like we just wait for six blocks. And, uh, but yeah, in the future, it might have to change if we think it's not so safe enough. But for now, like we just wait for six blocks. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. One of them is about the hardware component. How do you make sure that there's like a decentralized network of like the people who are provers if you're like working with specific companies? Like how do you make sure that the provers are a decentralized network versus being like centralized to one or two specific like FPGA companies or GPU companies that become very large stakers. And then my second question is, so this, this, this process for decentralizing this, the prover, can you talk about some of the differences for challenges in decentralizing the sequencer? Like how does those two processes differ? And like what are some of like the, the different considerations for decentralizing a sequencer versus the, the prover? Thank you. Yeah. That's a very good question. So for the first one, as I mentioned, like we will have two versions. First is that as we are collaborating with the external companies, we will also open source a permissionless licensed GPU prover. So anyone can directly use the GPU prover if they don't want to use FPGA or some other companies. And uh, we are not incentivizing the fast prover. Because for example, like even if someone has an ASIC prover or someone has an FPGA prover, uh, they don't necessarily like you can beat you. Because so the strategy is that we will have a time period for submitting the proof. As far as you can like, submit the proof in time, like, you can be like, incentivized. So it doesn't necessarily you have to generate like, you know, one minute. You, you can always beat the, 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 the other provers. So it's more like for parallelization and how you are like, making use of the computation power across the whole network in parallel. It's not like so even if you have those hardware partners, partners Pro, like companies, you can still choose like whether you just want to run independently using GPU prover or using their service. And so that's for, for question one. And for question two, so so what we are when we are thinking of this is that so the prover is easier to be decentralized because for example we are having for now like at this stage we are having a centralized coordinator. So you can still have some like you know for example verifying the proofs and doing something like that. And uh, so when we are thinking of decentralized prover and sequencer, because it's actually two communities. Because the prover community requires specialized hardware, but the sequencer might be like just some like some level of, of like uh, decentralization. And when you are making the, 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 the sequencer decentralized, there are some like problems. Like for example, like uh, you if you want to do some like force withdrawal and uh, like order transaction, there it's, 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 it's much much harder there than like using a centralized sequencer. 
So that's my part of the, the, the problems, and also like how you incentivize between like sequencer and prover, and how to balance those those, those incentivize. That's also part of the, the challenging problem we, we, we face, and how to make your the whole system more efficient because you you, you still need some consensus there among those sequencers, and uh, yeah, if that. <laughs>